So welcome back to Physics of Music. In our last video, we talked about how physics as an endeavor gives us a way of predicting the future from what we know and observe in the present. And we tried this for a very simple artificial universe that I showed you in a simulation where we just had a happy face moving around and after observing that, we figured out the rules for how the happy face moved. And then what we were able to do is, given the position and the velocity of the happy face at some particular time, and then given knowledge of the environment of the happy face, we were able to apply the rules that we knew, the rules of physics in that universe, to predict where the happy face would be at any later time. And so in this video, I want to start talking about doing the same thing in our own universe. So first, let's talk about some of the very basic properties of our universe. And it'll be useful to contrast that with the checkerboard universe that I showed in the previous video. So the checkerboard universe was basically just a big grid of spaces that things could be. It was an eight by six grid and it was two dimensional. And that means that we basically can specify all of the locations by two numbers. How many squares are you from the left and how many squares are you from the top? So it was kind of a discrete space. We would use the word discrete to indicate that there are only specific, there were, in this case, a finite number of specific positions, okay? There weren't, there, the happy face was not able to be halfway between or 42% of the way in between the squares that was right on the squares. There was also a discrete time in that universe. We had a certain configuration and then after a time step, we had a new configuration after another time step, we had a new configuration, and there was nothing really in between. And we had a very simple set of rules for how the happy face moved around. So in our universe, the first thing is that we have a three-dimensional universe, at least in our everyday experience. So that basically means that we need three numbers in order to accurately specify the location of something. On our cell phones, the GPS takes those three numbers as the latitude of your position, the longitude of your position, and some kind of height above sea level. So those are the three kinds of numbers that we would use specifying positions or locations on Earth or above the surface of Earth if you wanted to specify the precise location of an object, say, in this room, what you might do would, sit, would be to say, how far is it from that wall? How far is it from that wall? And how far above the floor is it? And then once you specify those three numbers, then you know exactly where the object is. So that's the notion that uh, our universe is three-dimensional. The next observation is that instead of this discrete universe uh, uh, that we had in the checkerboard, we have a continuous universe, or as far as we can tell, objects can be at any kind of location that you could imagine. Uh, so if, if you could have, you could have an object here or here or at any position in between. And similarly, time seems to move along continuously. Things can happen basically at any time, not just, say, even numbers of seconds. Okay. And so we have various kinds of objects. At a fundamental level, we have atoms or electrons or whatever. At any given time, these things have positions and they have velocities. And so what we want to do is start to figure out the rules for how those positions and how those velocities will change with time. So it turns out that, well, our universe is fairly complicated, but we can best start to understand the rules 
by thinking about how things behave in a very simple environment, in the simplest possible environment. So going back to the checkerboard situation, there were already simple rules, but the rules would be even simpler in an environment where you only had the white squares. In that case, the happy face would just keep going in the same direction forever. And so in our universe, similarly, we could imagine a simplified environment and start by understanding how things behave in that simplified environment. So the simplest possible environment you could imagine in our universe would be the environment of just empty outer space or, or in outer space, maybe far, far away from any planets or stars so that there's no gravitational forces acting on your objects. Okay, so that's the environment that we're going to imagine ourselves in now. And what we want to do is try to imagine the behavior of objects in that environment. And now, of course, these days, that's a lot easier than it was hundreds of years ago for people like Isaac Newton. Uh, nowadays, we get to watch lots of space movies and we can even watch live video of astronauts out in space. And so we have some idea how things behave out there. So I want you to take a moment to imagine that you're a, an observer out in deep space somewhere and you're observing some object. And I want you to think about what might that object be doing? What are the possibilities for how things could move uh, in, in that deep space environment? Okay, so let me show you a simulation. I'm not actually gonna take you out into outer space, but we can do the next best thing, which is to watch a simulation of how things actually would behave. Okay, so here it is. This is my simulation of outer space. So this is a simulation of physics in outer space, very far from any stars or planets. And so far there's, there's just empty space, but here comes an object. And so this is what would happen. So we see it's for a 3D happy just space. an isolated spherical object in outer space. This is just one example of what you might see. And then here is another example. I'll make it interesting and have two objects at the same time. But if we imagine these are very small objects, and not interacting with each other gravitationally, then this is what they would do. Okay, well, you might have been worried that those last two objects were going to collide with each other, but that just showed that we were actually in three-dimensional space in our universe, and so the orange one was actually in front of the yellow one. And so, so some of you may have been able to visualize that. That might have been what you were expecting uh, for other people. Maybe you don't really think about what the physics in deep space would look like. So let's kind of break it down and think about our observations there and see if we can understand something about the rules for the behavior of objects in deep space. So the first thing we want to do is just understand the information that we need to describe an object at a particular time. And so if you look at that 3D yellow smiley face, then the first thing that we can say is that it's at some position. So at any time, the thing is at some location it has some particular velocity, and by velocity we're talking about the speed of the object and the direction in which it's moving. We also noticed that the object could have an orientation in space, and so it, given any solid object, we could, we could 
rotated around in different ways. And so at part of the specification is what orientation is the object in? And there was some kind of rotational motion. So the object was, in this case, it was just a spherical object. We saw that it was rotating around a particular axis. And the final piece of information that we needed to specify the behavior of that object at any time was the period or the frequency of this rotation. So I've indicated all of these things on the diagram. And so that's the complete set of information that we would need to specify the behavior of a solid object in outer space at any particular time. And so our goal in this case is going to be able, is going to be to predict what these quantities will be in the future after a certain amount of time, given their values at the present time. And so again, what we want to do is make our observations of how these things were behaving and understand the rules. Okay. So you could, you could go back in the video, watch it again, and see if you can figure out the rules for how each of these things change. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about these rules. Okay, so first let's talk about the rules for the position and the velocity. And so today I'm basically just going to state the rules as observations. And next time we're going to talk about in more detail where these things come from. How can we understand them from a more fundamental point of view? So just the rules as our observations would be that number one, these objects just seem to be moving in at a constant rate in a fixed direction. And so we can say that the velocity of the various objects that we observed that seemed not to change with time, just stayed the same during the entire simulation. The position of our objects did change, and it changed at a uniform rate, which really is just the same thing as saying that the velocity is fixed in time. Okay, so we just a little bit more precisely, we can say that the position changes in the direction of the velocity and in a time t, the position changes by an amount given by the standard formula relating distance and velocity and times. So the object moves a distance given by the velocity times the time. So the larger amount of time we wait, the further it goes. So this equation just expresses the fact that the, if the velocity is just some constant number, then the object moves a distance which is proportional to the amount of time that we wait. Okay. Um, we're going to talk in later lectures a lot about rates of change of various quantities. And so one thing to point out here is that this velocity is our first example of a rate of change. The velocity is the rate of change of the position of an object. But we'll see that concept coming up a lot more in the future. Okay. Let's skip this for now. And I just want to talk, so we'll get back to that question next time. What I want to do is talk about the rules for the rotational part of the motion. And similarly, what we noticed is that the objects seem to be rotating about an axis that did not change. Okay. I should say at this point, that's something special to spherical objects. And, and that's all we'll need to consider for now. So let's make that assumption that we're talking about spherical objects. And then this rule is basically that the rotational axis doesn't change and that the speed that the thing was rotating around at also doesn't change with time. Okay, so that, that's kind of rule number three, that the rotational period and axis are constant in time. And rule number four is just about the orientation, how that changes in time. And like the position, the orientation was changing at a uniform rate 
which is determined by the period of rotation. So these are the simple rules of physics in outer space. And in the next lecture, we're going to apply these rules to see how we can predict the future position, velocity, orientation, and rotational period given those things at the present.